So what we're doing tonight is we are doing Module 7, and it's all about files. Up until now, all of the data that we have worked with has been in-memory data. So the program is running. We enter a piece of data. The program does something with that piece of data. And when the program exits, the data goes away because it's not stored anyplace. Files are about storing data because basically that's all you've got, whether it's in a huge relational database or it's a Word document or even if you have like Google Drive and you use that to do papers or Excel spreadsheets, all of those are files sitting on a computer somewhere. So what we're learning in this module is how to manage files. So, and, and just like we had with lists and dictionaries when we talked about CRUD, create, read, update, delete, you can do the same with files, create, read, update, delete. And that's what we're going to be doing all of tonight, well, for the next hour. So Python gives you the ability to open a file, to close a file, to write, to read, all kinds of stuff you can do to a file. Um, the basic thing you do with a file is open it. Now, when you open a file in Python, you use the open function. You get it. It's just like print. It's like input. It's another function that Python gives you. And it allows you to manage data stored on a disk. All files have names. Open takes a parameter, because it's a function. It can take a parameter. And the parameter it takes is the file name. So here, let's make this a little bigger. You have my journal equal open journal.txt. So that's what open does. And that's the simplest way to use open. And just to understand, journal.txt or whatever file you're using is separate from the script. Okay, it sits on the disk separately. Maybe I created it with a text editor. Maybe I created it with Microsoft. However you created it, it is separate from your script. Um, so when you open a file, you get something called a file object. Okay, and that file object, now we're going to talk more about objects in module 8. That file object is basically the information about the file and a way to get at the data in the file. So that's what the file object is. And because it's an object, you not only get information about it, you get things you can do to it. So I know we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit when it comes to understanding the file object. But for now, um, let's just say that when you have a file, you can then do things to it. It's very much like when you have a string, you can use the format function, or when you have a list, you can use the sort function, um, the same thing with a file object. With a file object, you can read it, which means you can get at the data inside the file. And one thing we always have to remember is to close it. Now, why do we have to remember to close a file? Because every time we do an open, we are actually taking up a system resource which is basically called the file descriptor. And you only get so many file descriptors on a, uh, on, a, on a system, whether it be Windows or Linux or Mac. You only get so many file descriptors. So you want to manage that limited resource appropriately. And the way to do that is every time, make sure when you are coding, every time there's an open, there's a corresponding close. Now, is it going to matter a lot in this class? Probably not. 
but it is something that you need to get used to. And if you're in my class, it's something I'm going to look for in your code when you do your labs. I'm going to make sure that you are closing your files. Now, there's actually a way to open them without formally having to close them because Python will do it for you. And we will get to that in a minute. So there's a bunch of different um, things you can do with a file. So I'm going to stop talking here, and I'm going to actually do a little bit of programming. So I'm going to create a new Python file, and I'm going to say simple file. And then I'm going to create another file. I'm just going to make it a text file. Uh, Python, I just want a plain text file. Just a file. Okay. This is going to be just a file.txt. I'm going to put in a line, and it's just going to be this is just a file. So I've just created a file called just a file, and I've added three lines to it. So let's figure out how I can use Python to get at the information in this file. So first, I'm going to configure my interpreter. Okay. Um, and then I'll add a configuration in a minute. So first, I want to get that file descriptor. So I'm going to say my file equals open, and I'm going to give it the name of the file. And it's going to be just a file.txt. And now I don't need to do anything else because I know that just a file.txt is in the same place on my directory structure as the Python file. But this could be a fully qualified path. This could be C colon users or, or whatever system you're working on. So let's just do this. I'm going to print my file so we can see what's in there. And then I'm going to make sure I close my file. I'm going to say my file dot close. And it's going to close itself. So let me set the configuration. Python, and we will walk through this and see what happens. Okay, so I've got the debugger. I've got a breakpoint here, and I'm going to start the debugger, and we're going to see down here I stopped on my file equal open, so I'm going to step over, and I now have a file object. My file is what they're calling the object in this case is a text.io wrapper. So that's what this name means, text.io wrapper. And when I click on it here in PyCharm, I get all this stuff. Okay, so that's closed. That's open. So there's a buffer. And a buffer is just a place where Python is going to store some of the data from the file. Now, right now, my file has three lines in it, but I could have a file with millions of lines in it. And Python doesn't want to read all of that file in at once. So it's trying to be smart about it, and it's going to create a buffer. So it can put some pull stuff out of the file into that buffer, I, give me access to do what I want in the program, and then when I tell it to go get more, it's going to add more data to the buffer so that it's not reading what could potentially be a huge file in to the computer's memory all at once. Encoding, it says closed is false. If you have a file pointer and you don't know if the file is closed, you have the information in the actual file pointer itself. Encoding just tells you whether it's UTF-8, ASCII, UTF-16. Um, and, and these are just, it's got the name, it's got the mode, and we're going to talk more about modes in a moment. But right now it's saying my mode is R, and R is read. 
Um, and don't worry about new lines and right through. So I got my flat file pointer. Now one of the things, let's see, let's go look at buffer. Okay, one of the things you will notice is that in the buffer, there's nothing that looks like those three lines of code, or sorry, those three text lines from my file. And that's because it hasn't been written and in, read into the buffer yet. I haven't told it to put anything into that buffer. So at this point, all that I have is a pointer to a file on the system. I don't have any of the information that's in that file. I do not yet, in my Python file, have those three lines of code. What I have to do is I'm going to have to read those lines in. So let me just continue on. Hold on. Let me continue here. And it's done. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a read. I have this object called my file. And on this object, I'm going to say my file dot read. Let's just see what happens. I'm going to say lines equal. And I'm going to print lines. So let's do this again. So I just made a couple of changes. I just basically added this line where I'm calling this read function on that file. So let's see what happens when I do that. Okay? I, I know I can open it. So it's opened. I have my file. Let's see what happens Come on. when I read those lines. Now, what does lines have in it? Let me close this down. Sorry. Lines actually now has all three lines of code as a single string, and it has the new lines the slash ends, the new lines, in between those. So basically what read does is it takes every single bit of data in that file and puts it into that variable called lines. So I have one big string. Now I could split this and turn it into a list. But there are better ways to read information from a file. So you'll notice right now that read gets me what I want but maybe not in the way I want. So let's go back and look at what um, what Zybooks is telling us. So we have line. We also have this read lines method. And this returns a list of string. So instead of that read, I'm just going to change this to read lines. And I'm going to debug this again. I'm going to step over. The only difference here is that I'm using read lines instead of read. So I just changed that. And now I have a list. Okay? And that list has three elements. It has the first line. Notice that the new line is still there. It didn't get rid of the new line. It just used that new line as a place to put a comma. And then it has the second line in the file with a comma and the third line. So one of the things we need to take away from this if you're reading a file is that if you have new lines in that file, those new lines are going to come in as part of the file information. And if you don't want those new lines, you're going to have to use string functions to strip them. But that's the difference between read lines and read. Read is just going to give you one big long string. Read lines is going to give it some structure. And the structure it's going to give you is a list. So um, one thing I did want to say is once you're done reading the lines of data, you can close the file. So I can close the file, and I can do this. So you'll notice I've closed here. 
but that data still stays in the file. So I've got, well, let's, let's debug. We'll just walk through it and debug. So I'm going to open it. I know how to open it. I'm going to read the lines, which is going to give me my wonderful list. I'm printing it out just so I know what it is. And now I'm closing it. And that file pointer when I close is going to go away. Okay? It's not really usable. I have lost the ability to read it data from that file. However, if I look at lines, lines is still fully populated. So even though I've closed my entry into that file, I in fact still have the data in my, in my Python. It's still there and I can do whatever I want with it, including walking through this for loop. Okay? So that's one thing to remember about close. Once you've read all of the information in from the file, you can close the file. You don't need to keep that file open because the data is there. Um, now, here's another way to read lines from a file. And, and it's, it's, it's less work, and there's actually going to be one other way that's even less work. So I can, in fact, read lines without calling the read line function. I can say for line in F. It's one of those great little for in time savers that Python gives you. So you have for in list, for in range, for in all kinds of things. You can do the same with the file. And it will simply read each line in the file. So now we're going to write files. Figured out how to read them, so now let's write. I'm just going to create a new file. Let's call it, whoops. Just going to call it simple write. Simple write. Okay. So writing is the opposite of reading when it comes to files. So I'm going to just create a list. Actually, let me just do a string for right now. Meister equals this will end up in a file. And now I'm going to create a file. I'm going to say my file equals uh, open from simple write dot txt comma space plus w. I think it's sorry, I gotta look. I apologize. I was I've been programming in Java and Bash all day. It's not plus W, it's just W. Ignore the plus. It's just W. So I have now given a mode to my open. So open the last time it just took the file name. Now I have given it this other parameter called W. Why didn't I do that when I was reading the file? Reading and writing are modes on a file. They're, they're an indication to Python of what you're allowed to do to the file. You can have a file that's for read, that's read only. You can have a file that's write only. You can have a file that's read and write. Read is the default mode for a file. If you don't do anything else, Python will assume that the only thing you're ever going to do is read a file. That is why in simple file, we didn't do any. We didn't put a quote R. We could have, but we didn't. Here, I'm saying I'm specifically opening this file for writing. So I'm going to take whatever data I want, and I want to write it to the file. Well, let's see how I can do that. I can say my file dot write or write lines. We're just going to use write at this point. And I'm going to put Meister. And then I'm going to say my file dot. Actually, I'm going to say my file dot close. 
and let's see what happens. Again, this is just a simple file. There's nothing crazy or fancy in it. We are simply just putting that text into a file that's going to be called from simplewrite.txt. Now you'll notice over here that from simplewrite.txt doesn't exist yet. It's not here. I haven't put it anywhere on my file system. So let's see what happens. And let's see if my Python brain has kicked in and my Java brain hasn't. So we're going to, we created a string, it's there. We created a file. It's a file for writing. So the mode is W, I can see that right up there. And I'm going to step over it and I'm going to write my stir. Now it's interesting, look over here in this list. That file does not, it's still not been written to the disk. So that's a problem. How does it get written to the disk? Well, let's see what happens when I do close. And all of a sudden, over here, that text file has shown up. And I can open it up in PyCharm. That's because the file didn't get written until I closed the file pointer. OK? Now, in the case of very large files, Sometimes Python is going to go out there and write to the file before you close because you're going to want to buffer it and all that stuff. But anyway, that's an important point. If you are working on a lab and you have and you're writing and you have not closed the file, you may have trouble. You may have trouble. It, well, you will have trouble in PyCharm. You may have trouble in Zybooks. So. Um, and you can call write as many times as you need. Uh, you, you, you can write it once, you can write 15, you can put, you know, write in a loop. It doesn't matter. It's just a function call, and that function call is going to deposit some amount of information into the file that you have defined using open. Now, I can reuse that again right now. I have simplewrite.txt. Let me change this and run this again, okay, and see what simplewrite.txt looks like. Now you'll see that that XXX I just added showed up in that file. And that's because Python rewrote the file. So I just wanted to show you that even if the file existed, which it did the second second run, that Python will still write to it. So if it doesn't exist, Python will create it and write to it. And if it does exist, Python will overwrite the information that's in that file. So let's keep going. Flush. If you're dealing with very, very large uh, files, Okay, you'll want to use something like flush. And flush just says take it out of the buffer and write it to disk. Because Python, you may not want to rely on Python for when it's going to write something to disk. Now, here also you can see there's a third parameter to open, which is buffering equals. And buffering is just how many lines are you going to buffer? And right now, we're just telling Python we're going to buffer 100. But if you want to be sure at certain intervals that things are getting read, read, sorry, written to the file, you're going to want to flush the buffer. Okay? That buffer is an intermediate space before the dip, before actually writing it to hard drive. What are the pros of doing that? Well, it's actually on the hard drive. If your, compute, if your program dies, some of that data actually made it out. What's the con? One of the most expensive operations you can do with a computer is write to disk. So you have to, you know, the safety of, of actually having something written to disk versus how many times do you want to flush because that's a performance hit. In this class, you don't have to worry about making those decisions. When you're out there in programming, you do, okay? So uh, there will probably be other things that come into play. But that's why when you're reading this, that's why they have a flush. 
so that you can force a write to disk. So interacting with the file systems. One of the wonderful things I love about Python is you don't have to know a lot about the file systems. What are some ways to decide buffering? There are all kinds of ways to decide buffering. You can decide buffering. Um, OK, I'll get back to where the, pi, the, the text file was in PyCharm. Um, there are all kinds of ways that you can decide buffering. A lot of that, ha you have to take into account the, um, the speed of the system you're going to be running your code on, the amount of disk space, the amount of RAM. Okay, Python runs in RAM. All programs, or almost all programs, run in RAM. You've got a big system with a lot of RAM that can hold a lot of data and you're going to do a lot of processing on that data, then you're probably not going to need to worry about flushing and buffering. If you have, if you're potentially running on a system that doesn't have a lot of RAM, then you may want to flush to disk and then run with only certain parts of the data. Now this is going to take more processing and it's also going to take some different buffering strategies that are, there are all kinds of interesting buffering strategies. I don't know, um, I don't deal with a lot of the scientific buffering strategies that you can use. I work with a couple guys who do and they're very, very smart. But when you decide whether or not you're going to be, well, you're always going to be buffering some amount. When, when you need to decide if you need to flush rather than just allow Python to do it is when you're dealing with large data sets or you're dealing with real-time information. If you've got real-time information and that information has to be saved, you're going to want to flush. You're going to want to force the buffer to write it to disk. Um, Okay, glad you got the text file part. So, um, so there are ways to deal with files on a disk. So there, there is a module called OS. Now we haven't really talked about modules. We're going to talk a little bit more about modules um, next week. Anyway. A module is just a library of code that somebody else has written that you don't have to write. Python has a lot of standard modules that you get, but it doesn't get loaded into your script unless you tell it. The way you tell it to make, that, make those functions available is with the import command. The import command says take the OS module and load it up into RAM so I can get at those functions. That's exactly what the import does. And there are massive amounts of modules out there. Python has modules. There are third-party vendors that have modules. There's open source modules. You can go out on GitHub and find them. There are all kinds of modules for all kinds of things. One of the ways that you can um, manage files on disk using Python is with this OS module. You can determine if a file exists. You can delete it. You can create it if you want to create it before Python's going to do anything. I um, recently for work, I, as a side project to help some people out, um, they wanted to use IBM Watson to create voiceovers for videos because it takes a long time apparently to create voiceovers for videos. IBM Watson has this wonderful Python API. So I spent about two days and I developed um, a system so that they can just type in their scripts to what's called a, uh, to a file that has a YAML format. And then Python would go out and it would read the information to, for the slide. It would double check that the, you know, the 
uh, MP3 file didn't already exist. If it did, it would remove it or it would place it in a backup directory and it would go out and it would send the text to Watson and Watson would send back the audio and it would be written out and remodulated. So, and I used the OS module for a lot of that for the file management. So that's just some of the stuff you can do with um, with the OS module. It's got lots of great management. And one of the nice things about Python is that you are removed from having to understand what's actually going on in the operating system. You are a far enough level above where you don't have to worry about the slashes and you don't have to worry about what's actually happening at the operating system level. Python's going to do all that for you. So and here they've got another module they're importing date time. So let's say I need a date for something. I can import date time and then I can use the uh, functions in the date time module to get information. So I don't have to deal with the, I don't have to understand the system clock on my Mac. Python does that part of the understanding for me. Let's say I'm creating a file and I need to give it a timestamp. I don't have to go out and talk to the system clock. I say, hey Python, I'm using your date time module. Give me the date, you know, and um, I'm going to use it to, you know, give a timestamp to my file. Excuse me, sorry. Um, you can create paths and you can split paths. This is all very, very handy. Uh, let's see, binary data. There's human readable data and data that is not human readable. Um, everything I've done so far tonight in class is human readable. This will end in a file is human readable. Okay, so whoops, my bad. So what did I just do? Okay, what I just did is I put a B in in front of this string. Now that B is an indicator to Python that I want that to be binary data. Okay, I can read it when I'm looking at it in Python right now, but I I don't want to store it. As, as strings. I want to store it as binary. So what I can do is I'm going to just comment this guy out and I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to change this to stir binary and let's see what happens when I run this. Okay. Whoops. Oh, my bad. I did that wrong. Uh, I think it's a right binary. Ah, uh, yes, RB. It's the uh, WB. Right binary. Okay. So I did two things. First of all, I put this B in front of the string and outside the quotes. It's very important. This B outside the quotes before a string tells Python it's supposed to treat it as a binary. And a binary is not human readable. And how do I know? Well, because I'm going to open this guy up. Whoops. That's not right. I should not have put it there. Okay. Well, let's just do this. Binary. Oh, it's still got the B in front of it. My bad. Okay. Um, so 
So there's reading it. I don't know why it didn't write it binary, and I apologize. I will go back and fix that before I put it up on the um, in YouTube. But binary data should look like this. It's basically just a bunch of hexadecimals, and it is not human readable. And why do we do that? Well, sometimes we don't want data to read it. Sometimes there are specific format things that have to go in, and they're not necessarily human readable. We use hexadecimals in the code we have quite often because it's actually a bit faster and um, it just, at the time, it makes more sense. But that's what these are. These are just, those are binary. Um, and that's why you can't read it. And by the way, this is a bitmap file that actually displays an image when you have a bitmap reader. So a lot of things, like Microsoft Office documents, a lot of things are in binary. OK. Command line arguments and files. You may not know where your file is. Right now in PyCharm, we know where our file is. It's right there. But you may not know on a real file system. So you may have to have a way to tell it. Okay? And there are a couple ways to do it. So somebody is going to give you an argument, you know, and say, hey, this is my file. And then you're going to need to figure out if that file exists and then what to do with it if it doesn't exist. Okay, the with statement. This is one of those handy things in Python that I, I just love about it. It just makes, it makes things so much easier. What you can do is What you can do is you can uh, open a file, process the data in it, and never have to worry about the close. So I'm going to have I'm going to have my just a text file right here, and in my simple whoops in my simple width, I'm going to have this for sorry with. What's the, yeah, with open. Okay, with open, just a file, whoops, dot txt, and I'll show you what that error would have been in a minute. Uh, read, whoops as f print f actually as oh sorry no goodness me yeah f dot read line not being smart okay yeah dot and that's it. And it'll close the file for me automatically. So what did I do here? I have a keyword with, and it kind of looks like you would be doing a for loop, but this is a specific kind of loop. Just, or not really a loop, it's just a specific way of opening a file and then being done with it. So open just a file dot text r plus, it's just reading it, as f, and then I'm just going to do f dot read line. Now let me see what happens when we do this, and then we'll go from there. Uh, simple with, so, hmm, it would help if I used the right syntax. My apologies. Okay, it read the first line from the file, and then it closed it. Well, that's all good, but, you know, maybe, um, well, in this example, it allows you to read each line in and then close it.
So you could put a for loop in there. You could have read each of the lines individually. But the nice thing about this is, is it closes the file when it's done. And so I always suggest that you use the with open. Okay, that's fine if you lose connection. Um, I will be putting this up on YouTube, so, and I, I understand that my work got interrupted yesterday because we had a nasty storm here. So, stay safe. So, comma separated value files. If you've ever, ever, ever worked with a spreadsheet, you have worked with something that is saved as comma separated values. Um, and there is a, a nice little module called CSV in Python that allows you to deal with comma separated value files. Now, remember when we were talking in lists about multidimensional lists? Well, this is basically a list of lists. That's what a comma separated value file is. You can give it a delimiter and you'll read it in um, like a list of lists. It's just very simple and very easy. Okay, so this is the first lab and I think that there was a request for this, right? So, um, Okay, the first lab. Okay, so let's talk about word frequencies. Okay, so let's talk about this lab. So you have input1.csv and that reads the name of an input file and then reads the file using the CSV reader method. The file contains a list of words separated by commas, your program should output the words and their frequencies the number of time each word appears in the file without any duplicates. Okay, that is actually very similar to a lab we did where we used the count for a list. So let's just go look up Python list count. Okay. So let's go to our W3 schools and we have this great count method. So we've already done counting for a list. So we know about that. So that's one thing to look at. So now what we're adding here is we're, we're reading in from input1.csv. So let's do something similar to that. I'm going to just create a file. Okay, and it's just going to be a file, and I'm going to call it test.csv, okay? And I'm going to just, it's going to be a comma separated, and I'm just going to say um, A, B, A, B, C, D, A, B, E, F. And I'm just doing letters because it's easier for me to type A, okay? So this is a comma separated file, all right? And I am going to do, we're not gonna do the entire lab, but we will get it started. So this is lab, what's the number of it? 7.8. Okay. Okay. Um, you're not necessarily misunderstanding something when you submit it. Um, so what what you're doing is you, they want you to read in the name of an input file. So you're going to have an input statement. So Python has a place to put the name of the file. Okay. So the first thing you're going to do in uh, where did I, where did I go? I guess I didn't create that. Oh, and I don't want test CSV there. I want it here. Okay. Um, so you're going to have to have an input for the name of the file. That's where that's coming from. So Python, so Zybooks can change the name of the file 
as it needs to. Come on, there we go. Okay. Um, sorry. I thought I just created that. 7.8. Okay, so the first thing you're going to have to do is input. I'm just going to put a... I'm just going to put that there so you can remember. And then let's go in and look at how to read in the CSV. So let's go back and take a look at this import statement. So we have import CSV. I'm going to do a with open. And then I'm going to use the CSV reader to read in the grades. So let's just do that. So the first thing, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say import CSV. All right, and I get it because it's with Python. And I'm going to say with, if I can type. And right now I'm just going to call it test.csv. You will have gotten the name of that file from the input statement you're going to put there. And I'm going to do it for re reading. Okay, as CS. We'll just use their CSV file. So now I want to read in the CSV file. So, uh, words equal the file dot, sorry, file dot, and then I'm going to, what, what read did they use here? It was just read CSV reader dot reader. Okay. Oh, I see what they're doing. My bad. Not looking. So I'm going to read it in. I've got an open file. I actually don't know what the type of file is at this moment. Then I'm going to use CSV reader. Actually, it's probably going to be CSV dot C reader. What am I typing wrong? I'm just going to copy and paste. I'm sorry. My brain is CSV dot reader. My bad. My apologies tonight. Okay. So CSV dot reader. I was not reading it right. I wasn't typing it right. See, it's going to read in CSV file, assuming it's a CSV file, and we know it is. And then um, and the delimiter is a comma because it's a comma separated file. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print words. I should have called it letters, but so let's just see what happens when I run this. Okay, so where is it? I don't know why it's doing this. My bad. Don't know why it's putting them in the wrong place. I'm just going to close that. And now I will do that. We'll set it as the file to run. Okay, so let's do a little debugging. There. And then I'm going to debug it. Okay. Now remember, I'm not doing any input statements. You guys are doing the input statements. So there's an input right there. Step over. Now what does words show me in the debugger? Well, words is a CSV reader object. So, ah, uh, grades reader. Why didn't mine read that in right? CSV reader, so that's the object. For row in words. what happened. 
happens. Okay, my bad. I was not deep enough into the object. CSV reader creates a CSV reader object, so that's what the reader does. And then when I iterate over it, when I iterate over words, then it will give me each row. So what I can then do is I can look at each individual word, or in this case letter, and do a count. And we know how to get to, so I could print row of zero. So let's just do that. Row of zero is A. And so if I wanted to know how many um, there are, I would say, what did they want us to put out here? Okay. What? So it would be word and then a space. So it would be a word and then the number. So I would do format. Uh, row of zero and then row dot count row of zero. Sorry. Uh, for row in words, row. We'll do it like this. You can do it better. But given the fact that we're running late again, I'm going to cheat. Well, this isn't cheating. It would be very valid. So right now, it's not going to say, oh, I've already done that before. But what I can do now is I can run this, and we will see, oh, Index one out of range for positional args tuple. Hmm. I'm not reading in the data structure right. So we have A, the row of counter is A. Row of counter, stir row dot count, row of counter. So why did it give me that issue? Sorry, I'm, I'm debugging in my head. Yes, I do need to increment the counter. You are very, very right. Thank you. Okay, I'm still getting the index one out of range for positional args tuple which is coming from here. So row of, sorry, row dot count, row of counter. Positional args. Maybe it has a problem with that. So I don't think this is going to be the solution, but I'm just going to take that out as an issue. Wow. It's going to be right there. Okay, sorry. Yes. I was getting that error, too. I ended up having to convert words into a list. Ah, okay. Now I get it. That's a good idea. So... Row in words, I uh, will just do that then. So row equals row dot, row should be a list though. Okay. That should be a list already. And I can get to it like that. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's not right. I just want to see. So that's the same thing. Row of counter. Oh, that's my problem right there. Format. All right. Sorry, I need to make it bigger for my old eyes. Print open, format open, stir open. One, two, three, four. That was my problem. My parentheses were not balanced. And I had one parenthesis in the wrong place. Now let's see what happens. Much better. So that was that tuple issue. The tuple issue was actually, it's one of those times when programmers are notoriously, uh, are, are, are known for writing notoriously bad error messages. That had nothing to do with anything to do with the row or the counter. It had to do with the fact that I did not have my parentheses uh, in line. Oh, I think that's good. Word list plus equal word. I think that's excellent. So th what this gives you is it gives you an indication of what you need to do. Now, I'm not going to go any further because I'll get yelled at if we actually go through and do a solution. But this is about what you need to do. Okay? And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go through the entire row. So we're, we've got row in words, and then we will do four in row. And let me do this. I'll just do that. So I'm going to print letter. And then I'm going to say row dot count letter. And that's correct. And I don't need the counter anymore. It's called baby steps. And then we can take out code we don't need. And there we go. So now your, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do this so it only ever does it once per letter. So if I look at this, I have A2 and A2. I only want that to print once. So that's what you're going to need to go back and do for this lab. Now remember, the other thing you have to do is you have to have an input statement. I did not put an input statement in mine. But this file name comes from that input statement. Does that help, Jasmine? I'm going to keep on going. Okay, so sorting TV shows. So we want a program that reads in the name of an input file. Cool. I'm glad, I'm glad that was helpful. So for lab 7.9, okay, good, this is the last one. Um, we're going to read in the name of, the, of an input file, which we did before. And you're going to use file.readlines method to get the lines out of the file. Um, and it contains an unsorted list of a number of seasons followed by the corresponding TV show. Your program should put the contents of the input file into a dictionary where the number of seasons are the keys and the list of TV shows are the values, since multiple shows could have the same number of seasons. Sort the dictionary by the key and output the results to a file named outputkeys.txt. So we have an input file and the contents of the file look like this. 
okay? And then what they want us to do is is put it out rank. So Will and Grace had 10 seasons. Uh, Murder, She Wrote had 12 seasons. So they want us to be in, in a dictionary, and they want us to output in this specific format. Uh, sorry. So the file output keys.txt should contain that. And the file output titles.txt should just contain the titles in alphabetical order. Is that right? Results of the file. Sort the dictionary by values and output the results to the named file. So what we need to do here is have an input. So let's just, let's just walk through this. So we're going to, I'm just going to type in some comments right now. Input the file name. And once we've inputted that file name, we're going to open it, read, read lines. And we're going to have to put that into a dictionary. And then we're going to have to do two things. We're going to have to then app uh, dictionary. Number uh, key is the number. Number of seasons. Value is the title. And then we're going to have to output um, file one output is going to be uh, um, key value file two output is um, of value. Okay, so those are the things that we have to do. I'm not going to worry about inputting the file name. You guys know how to input the file name. We're going to open it. So I'm just going to create here a new just file. This is uh, text. I'm just going to do this because it's quicker and easier to use their test data. So basically, I'm going to do a read line. And the first line I'm going to read is going to be the key. And the second line I'm going to read is the value. And the third line is going to be the key. And the fourth line is going to be the value. So that's, that's something we know how to do. So I'm going to say with um, open seasons.txt for reading. as seasons, and then I'm going to do a read line. Oh, let's look at the EOL thing. And it's going to be a four. Hold on. I didn't go over something. I want to do that really quick. Comma separated the with statements. So, Inline arguments, binary data, byte objects. It's not what I want. I may have to go look that up. In the file system, that's not what I want. Sorry about this. There was something I wanted to talk about, and I thought Cybooks did it. Writing files should be on reading files. End of line. Read lines. Okay. So read lines method return a list of strings. So that's what we want to do here. We want to do a read lines. Okay, so um, just going to make it easy on myself. Season list equal uh, dot 
three lines. So I should have now a list of seasons. And actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm just going to create SL as a variable outside the with statement because after I read it, oh, I didn't need to put that semicolon. Sorry, programming in Java today. Semicolons will be everywhere. So I will have SL and I have read them in as a list. So now what I want to do is I'm going to do a four over my list. Okay. Um, And the first one is always going to be the key, and the second one's always going to be the value. So here, I'm just going to put a comment, and I'm going to say, look up even odd. So maybe it's not val in SL. Maybe it's val in range. Uh, zero comma len of SL uh, comma and then I'm just going to put something here that basically says look up how to do every two rows. Okay? So this is wrong but this is what you need to do. All right, so you can do four val in range from zero to the end of the list, but you want to basically do every two rows. So um, actually, I'm gonna look up something. Uh, for loop get two elements. So this is what you want to do right here. That's a little bit too complex. Yeah. So basically it's for key comma val in that. So there are a couple of different ways to do it, but go look up this. That may not be the best one. Either two elements code example. Okay? So you don't need to worry about the zip. But that's one way to do it. And then this is the other one. So go ahead and look it up. What you want to do is you want to go over two values at once. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, lots of semicolons in my life. Um, so that's what you're going to want to do there. And then you're going to create the dictionary. So for key val in. So look up how to do that. And then you're going to want to create the dictionary. So you would say... out here and then what you want to do is you're going to want to do my my dict of key equals val and that will add things to the dictionary or else you can append them um, and then you're once you have my dict then you're going to want to use my dict here and you're going to want to output it and this is pretty easy at this point because, well, you probably want to sort first. So, yeah, you're going to want to sort the dictionary. That might make it easier. If not, you can just walk through it using the keys. Oh, no, you can sort the keys. You can get the keys as a list. Get keys as a list and sort them. loop over sorted keys 
And then you can do two output files, it's not a problem. Okay? So that's, that's going to be the output one, and then before output two, you're going to want to get, get list of values and sort. And then you can output the alpha list there by just doing a for loop. Make sure to close your file. Does that give a little bit of help? So that's basically what the steps you need to take. So this is the new stuff. This is a little bit of new stuff, not much. Um, and then basically it's just dictionary and list manipulation. That's what you want to do. And some of this you can just look up. Um, you can just look up um, how to get the keys from a dictionary. That's out there on Google how to get the values, a list of values from a dictionary, that's all out there on Google. So, Jasmine, are you good? I know I've gone a little bit over. And are there any other questions you have? Not a problem. I'm glad you've got it. I hope to have this up tomorrow. It depends on how busy my day job is. I'm going to stop the recording, and you have a good evening.